Amazing. What a great story. Thanks. Glad to have you on our panel, Liam. So um, thanks to Marsheen. Thank you, the Irish Echo, for having us. Very excited to be here on this next panel with the people I will introduce in a moment. It's a nice spot for us after talking about the plans for the Irish Center in San Francisco and our colleagues talking about networking and diversity amongst Irish community members and Irish community organizations. So we're thrilled to be here. As I said earlier, I'm Aileen leonard Zebra. I'm the Executive Director of the Coalition of Irish Immigration Centers. This is an exciting topic for me as the coalition is made up of 10 Irish immigration centers across the United States doing absolutely magnificent work um, in communities across the country. I'm thrilled to be here, as we said, with Liam Reedy, the President of the United Irish Cultural Center in San Francisco. Natalie Nugent O'Shea, who's the Executive Director of Kelton Junction Irish Arts, Maureen Kennedy from the Irish Heritage Center in Cincinnati, and Pat Carolyn, who's the former president of the Gaelic American Club in Connecticut. So we are here to speak about innovating for the post-pandemic era. In advertising for um, this event, the Irish Echo sent a tweet the other day, said our cultural and community centers are the very backbone of Irish America. And I thought to myself, isn't that true? Um, this is in typical times when people come to gather and to take classes, and in our case, in the coalition, to get immigration or wellness help. But also, we saw the resilience and the strength of the community in uncertain times over the past two years like, with COVID. And not only was it strength and resilience, but it was innovation. And all of that leading to sustainability of not only the Irish culture, but the community centers that promote that culture throughout the United States. We all had the opportunity to speak the other day, and um, we could probably sit here all day and talk about sustainability of Irish community centers. But several topics came to the forefront of what's working for these particular organizations. I want to highlight them and then hand off to our panelists to talk more about the great work that they're doing in their organizations. Several of the overarching topics that we hit on were inclusivity, collaboration with community partners, cultural exchange, the hub of socialization in the Irish community and the importance of what that was and what it became in service provision as well as cultural affinity and sharing. Um, and then of course, financial sustainability and unique ways in which to achieve that to keep things going. And finally, touched on by our colleagues earlier, the importance of looking at gener uh, different generations of people coming to the centers and keeping Irish culture alive in America today. I'd like to hand off to Natalie. Natalie spoke really in depth about how the um, Celtic Junction Art Center actively works on being inclusive and actively works on bringing people into the center who have an Irish affinity and sharing the culture in that way. Well, there's a couple ways that that happens. You know, first of all is dynamic programming. If you don't have um, things that people can come and engage with and do and experience, they're, they're not going to um, become enmeshed with what you're presenting. They're not going to become where this is now my home or my hub. So uh, that excellence in programming comes from music, from dance, from things that people can actually come and do and try and experience. And in that process, what we found is so many of the people coming to do that have absolutely nothing to do with the Irish culture or immigration or background. Now, um, I myself, I'm kind of fourth, fifth generation. Um, Noonan, Nugent, Finnegan, Foley, it's all you know, kind of mixed up back in there with enough <laughs> Scandinavian to keep me on time. Um, but a lot of our people that are engaging um, just find the music fascinating. They find the dance intriguing. They saw this, and they see these things at festivals, at different ways that we work with our community partners, and they're just, I, I want to do that. I don't just want to hear it. I don't just want to see it. I want to do it. Um, and those people come in to do those things are young people that are from our Hispanic community or from the African American community or Eastern Indian community. We actually have quite a few families that are now from uh, the Eastern European areas, and they have no in-depth connection. It's incredibly important, I think, with the crisis of immigration that we're going through at the moment, which I know, you know, Aileen could talk about ad nauseum, but what it's really doing, it's nearly energized the rest of the community to say, oh, 
oh, I, I, you know, I might have an Irish background, but I didn't know this was actually as cool and as fascinating, as beautiful as it was. You know, if you're from Croatia and you're coming to do this because this is so powerful and so moving, well, I, I'll reinvest back into the community. So we're doing that with activity and then also with our social justice series. So we've worked, we've had the, the very deep pleasure to work with uh, Christy Keneally, who's sitting just out here, who will be honored today, and the African American Irish Diaspora Network, as well as I Am Irish, to really show that, you know, what it means to be Irish has a much broader understanding now. And so many people don't understand that. They're just seeing the, the whitewashed everything. They're seeing that um, thin slicing of what they think Irish is. And so by having the activities, by having the education, we're actually completely blowing the minds of what a modern Ireland represented in America is at present. And that's, that's the way forward, I think. At least that's part of what we're doing. But I know these guys right here are doing a lot of other amazing things too. To, to piggyback on what Natalie was saying, I know that everyone here, when we were talking, spoke about the importance now, now post-COVID, of bringing people back into the center. And I know um, that you were speaking, Maureen, about having you know students come in and volunteers come in and doing projects at the Heritage Center and how that continues, not only the cultural exchange, but also continues to promote kind of being a center in the community. Yes, that, that's been very successful for us. And we not only bring in the universities, but also the, the schools for the children. And we bring in lots of different things for all different ages. We're fortunate enough to have a 44,000 square foot building. So we have rooms for children. We have rooms for dance, for theater, for music. We have a pub, of course. Uh, we're building a kitchen right now. And uh, we have a ballroom. And we have a, a big um, center for all types of arts. And we bring in a lot of acts from Ireland. But also, uh, during the pandemic, when things were you know, starting to open up a little bit, people were really wanting to do something. So we had drive-in concerts. So people would come in on their cars. They would sit in their car, or they'd sit in front of their car. And we would bring in um, an act that would be distanced apart, and they would play music, and it was a really big success. And then on Sundays, we would bring in actual lunches, and uh, we would have uh, one man you know, perform for everybody. But the most important thing was to get people together and get them going. The older people were not going out, so we made phone calls to over hundreds of you know, senior citizens to bring them in, and that was always really successful. The children's room is a great room where the children can do arts and crafts and lots of things like that. And also, um, recently we brought in people who want to become American citizens, and we have meetings and we have actual uh, things where they develop and become citizens in the center, which is really quite exciting. There's so many different things happening. And one of the great things has been networking with all our friends here and also uh, people who are not here today but are probably listening online. And to work together as a group has been tremendous help for us, for the Irish Heritage Center. And we continue to grow. So it's, it's all very exciting for us. When speaking about bringing people in and bringing people together, you know, when Pat and I were talking, similar to the to the cultural center, the Gaelic American Club was a 501 c seven, so a social club initially. Um, historically, such an important part of the Irish community, right? A place for gathering. Um, our friends over here spoke about having the pub before people after work would come and and relax and whatnot. It's also a place, as we know, on the on the immigration side too, is a place for seeking information and getting support, a safe space, the culturally competent space. Um, and so, interestingly, the the club started there, but it evolved, Pat, right, in other partnerships and whatnot. So it kind of, kind of shows, demonstrates the importance of that history and, again, being a backbone in the community. Well, yes, it was the Center for Irish Immigrants. Uh, I'm first generation. My mother's Mayo. My father's Cavan. And it was the focal point of their social life as we grew up. And it continues to be that. For a lot of the Irish, even though immigration is not as critical a uh, factor as it had been to 
you know, attract the Irish community. Uh, as somebody earlier said, I don't know which one of the panelists said it, but everybody wants to be Irish. Uh, in any event, uh, we continue to flourish. Uh, Fairfield is 33 miles up the road on the uh, Sound. We have a building. We have about 6,000 members. We have a close affiliation with three 501c3 uh, programs, one of which you'll hear later this morning about the uh, Great Hunger Museum that's uh, being relocated from uh, Quinnipiac over to uh, Fairfield. We also have the uh, St. Patrick's uh, Gaelic uh, Football and Hurling Club, which are in the semifinals over in Gaelic Park in uh, the Bronx uh, next Friday. And we have uh, a um, 501c3 that uh, had functioned with the festivals that uh, we had uh, for, uh, up until about five years ago. Uh, during the uh, uh, pandemic, we did well. We had a very good manager by the name of Tom Flaherty from uh, Clifton, and uh, he put together a good program of uh, Zoom monthly meetings. Uh, the kitchen uh, continued to thrive as we expanded the takeout and also he put in picnic tables, picnic benches, and heaters for the side yard for outdoor dining. So the club is doing well. Uh, we, you know, are a focal point for Irish cultural and activities. And if you're ever in the area, stop in. Mm. We'll do. One of the things that we did talk about, and Natalie touched on it, and I'm going to hand over to Liam because he mentioned it in his presentation, is this idea of working with, you know, second, third, fourth, fifth generation Irish America here, um, immigration and, and uh, ways in which for people to immigrate to the United States from Ireland has slowed greatly in recent years, which is a whole nother panel session um, for a different day. Uh -huh. But... You said, Liam, you said on our call and you said in your presentation the other day, it's, it's getting people on the conveyor belt now. And, and the important role that culture and, and thoughts on heritage play in the community. Um, and if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Sure, yeah. When the history of the Irish Centre over the past four or five years will be written, I think a lot of uh, the early part of our work was actually uh, financial sustainability. How do you stop... Uh, hemorrhaging $9,000 a week with a, a business entity that was just burning through cash. And, uh, you know, the sad thing had to happen and the, the Irish Centre had to close. So one of the first things we had to do when, when several of us jumped onto the board and said, hey, we've got to fix this, we had to see where the expenses were and where our income was, uh, was coming in. And we didn't have much of an income at the time. Um, I always fall back to the members. And here's another catchphrase I've heard in uh, some of the board meetings. Our members are our first-class passengers. Now, you might envy first-class passengers if you flew into to JFK. You know, they have their nice seats and everything. But we treat our members and our donors like first-class passengers because they believe in what we're doing. They want to support. They're providing $13 a month for their dues. And they're also providing those large uh, capital donations to the 2025 project. Um, in terms of programming, um, you know, I'm the father of four kids, uh, heavily involved in Irish music. Uh, they all play music and do Irish dancing. And I remember one of the members, and I'm always listening. I find myself as a leader in, uh, in what I'm doing, is listening a lot. Of, and I do do a lot of talking. Um, <laughs> but I do find myself listening to those little tidbits of uh, questions or probing from people. I remember one guy said to, to my wife, why would I go to the Irish Centre? There's nothing there for my kids. Now, his kids were two and four, and he was absolutely correct. We don't have a, a daycare centre or anything like that. But it stayed with me. And this past spring, believe it or not, after 50 years, we had our first successful uh, of any type, youth music, people learning banjo, fiddle, piping, drums, guitar, singing, drama. We had our second annual Irish camp. And what I see in all of that is we are impacting about 80 kids this past spring. They both have parents, 160 of them. And the type of energy that's created in the background, all those synergies is only going to benefit, benefit us down the road. My dad always said when we had a small Gaelic hurling and football club, back home in West Limerick. Today's juveniles are tomorrow's seniors. And it's only as I've moved through the conveyor belt of life, I've realized, you know what, he's dead right. He's 80 now, and he's still giving me lots of wisdom. I met him a couple of weeks ago uh, back home. And uh, yeah, getting the people involved in the, in, in, in the center activities as itself. Now, when we talk about financial sustainability, and I'll kind of leave it at that, 
you have to activate the building. It doesn't matter, you're an event center. And as you know, most metropolitan areas, event centers are being destroyed and erased, and in its place is coming housing. But there's a lot of need in the community, outside of the Irish American community. We have Chinese ballroom dancing. Yeah. We have wrestling that takes place at the center. We have quinceañeras, we have Jewish holidays, we have a church that operates out of the Irish center. So, as Bob Brocker says, the price is right, come on down, we'll make it happen. <laughs> And one final thing about, you know, our own culture, looking after your own people. Prior to COVID, we had no Irish dancing schools at the centre. None. Incredible. Never been there. I went to each one of those schools and solicited. I said, what would it take to come back to the centre? They said, how much are you paying to the local landlord? You know, $40 for two hours. I said, could you do $35? We'll give you $35 and if you stay an extra hour, we won't charge you. And that was the beginning. There was pushback on the board because, hey, why would we charge $35 and have an, an, uh, our, one of our own staff there for $20 an hour? We're losing $5 on the whole, you know, commitment. I said, look, there'll be a lot more positive to come out of this and we've had probably 10 fish at the center since COVID. So that's another one of those kind of synergies that happens. But to work with your own people, don't forget those people because they're people who believe in you and can see what's happening, you know, transparently in the organization as a whole. So yeah, the future's bright on the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I think one of the things we did talk about too was, you know, COVID being awful and now hopefully we're on the other end of it, but really igniting, I mean, centers, cultural centers, immigration centers, uh, social centers pivoted so quickly to address the needs of their community members. And I think that some of that innovation has moved forward now into what we are doing every day. You spoke yes. about calls to seniors. I know some of our centers are doing those and they continue right. those checking they calls. Do. Some of the Zoom things that I know I popped on for each of you when you were doing them during COVID are continuing. We've expanded our network to relate back to the earlier panel. I don't know, Natalie, do you want to talk about a little bit how, how that innovation has continued on in your programming? Well, one of the hard parts um, with the innovation is some of the things that we started uh, when we came back to regular business, we're doing the regular business plus the things that we just invented. So it's actually, it's layering and it's double things up. Uh, my husband Cormac is our president of our center. He's sitting in here. And one of the things that his skills, it's like you bring all your skill sets to the table. Uh, we poured our energies into not just Zoom, but actually high-end uh, technology, video recording, um, playback, live streaming, Facebook. So all of a sudden, what changed? Our audience grew. We took that um, activity with the live streaming. Again, you know, not fuzzy Zoom and the sound going out, but really high-quality professional work. We applied that then to our classes. Um, and we've got 20 different educators that we have that cycle through different classes of history, literature, language, creative wellness, and arts. And all of a sudden, our audience grew. We've got people coming to us, taking classes, learning, um, in, interacting from all over, not just this country, but also Canada and even Ireland. I really blew my mind that somebody would <laughs> take a class from Minnesota who's living in Ireland. But obviously, you know, they found something in our programming that they liked. So we actually, we activated a lot of our, um, our abilities, our technologies, and then they've actually gone on to duplicate more. We were live streaming concerts. Well, now we've actually got people can come to concerts indoors. We built an outdoor stage, another innovation. Um, that was a huge one, you know, and I, we don't have the same weather darling. Um, you know, that's one of our disadvantages. We can't do outdoor dining, you know, but maybe like two months out of the year. Uh, but the outdoor stage all of a sudden opened it up to so many more people and it expanded uh, the understanding, the people in the neighborhood, the people in the local community. Uh, it, and then all of a sudden you're live streaming that. It's like, oh, this, this, looks and feels like a party. Yeah, I think I want to come and be a part of that. So it really was the innovation that got us going, but it's also keeping us going. And, you know, I suppose in more ways than I can uh, rattle off at the moment, but I know these guys are doing it too. Who's going to pass on to Maureen? What, what, what kind of innovative thing has continued on and, and you know, expanded your stake in the community, people know more who you are. Well, the outdoor concerts, of course, and also bringing in dignitaries like the mayor of Cincinnati, which for since we started the center, um, well, 13 years ago, we could never get the old mayor 
to come, but this guy came right away, and he's already promoting the Irish Center, and he, he looks at what's going on, and he's very, very happy that we have so many different areas that we're covering for so many different types of people, and they're all very welcome. In fact, I always say to people, you don't have to be Irish to come to the Irish Heritage Center. You only have to like to have a good time. <laughs> and boy, has that worked. <laughs> it's really brought us in so many new people and people that have never even known that there was an Irish Heritage Center in Cincinnati, which we're working on now. So those things have all been very successful, and we continue to, to do that. What about you, Pat? Anything as far as just changes that you had to make? I know you touched on them at the beginning, but is there anything that you think is continuing to secure your spot as a, as a you know, the backbone of the community there? Well, I don't know that we've been challenged in that we're the only team, I guess, left in town. As I grew up, every European nationality had their own club, and the only one that succeeded to this point has been the Irish club. Uh, yeah, I've always said that Irish organizations are pregnant with talent. The challenge of leadership is to try to identify that talent, get them to come aboard and come up with creative ideas that keeps you going. And the recent, most recent thing would be, as I said, the um, ongoing uh, acquisition of the Hunger Museum, uh, moving it from Quinnipiac down to uh, Fairfield. Um, we've not had a problem of getting membership uh, over the last seven or eight years, um, maybe longer, uh, they've developed a very successful uh, youth football and a hurling program. They participate every year in the CYCs, which are, I think, in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, and San Francisco, and I think this year is in Chicago. And they get a fairly large number of young players and their families traveling to those venues, which again, enables the young people to grow up to be the seniors of the future. Um, I, I think basically the inherent uh, benefit of any organization, again, is the members. And the challenge of the leaders are to find those people who can continue to uh, assure the success of a club. And fortunately, we've, we've been doing okay. Thanks. Yeah. Liam, I'm going to give you two seconds before we wrap up because I'm getting the time signal to ask for questions. <laughs> uh, just in terms of uh, innovation, I suppose, looking back on it, the financial pressure early on the first couple of years about the recovery and uh, rescue of the Irish Centre, we've kind of moved back towards our core mission and programming, and that's focusing in on the Irish arts. Uh, and just in the last couple of weeks, I've, I've received a proposal from a member of the community for a new drama club that would involve the you know, teenage uh, drama productions and theatre productions that would come online in the spring of 2023. And alongside the summer camp that we had this year, we just had a proposal for a, an Irish film camp for next year. So, you know, there's appetite in the community. Everyone is under tremendous, uh, you know, duress in terms of competition for eyeballs and getting kids on the ground. But once you get them into the building and get them excited about what they're doing, whether it's learning the tin whistle or the banjo, I think you have, uh, you've snared somebody, an, a member for life, so to speak. Yeah. Another asset that we have is the association with the two universities, Fairfield and Sacred Heart both of which have very strong Irish study programs, and Sacred Heart has its own campus over in uh, Dingle. So we're fortunate from that aspect as well to you know, keep up the cultural programs uh, for the uh, members. You know, years ago, we used to um, have to beg people to come to the Irish Center to perform, m mostly people from Ireland. And, and um, recently, we, you know, get people call us and say, can we come to the Irish Heritage Center? And it's so great because I'm in charge of getting all the talent into the center and making sure it's something that will be successful for everybody. But not only do the Irish come now to the center and want to perform or do diff different things at the center, have meetings, have weddings, have you know all sorts of things happening, but we also have people from, from Scotland and from various areas in the United, the United States, especially in Cincinnati, where there's a lot of German people, and we actually have a German-Irish room, which is our tea room, and uh, we continue on doing that, so we're very fortunate with that. So as you can see, 
Irish centres are alive, well, vibrant, growing, ready to support the community. Um, in examples in these four centres here, um, examples in the Irish Pastoral Centre from Boston and the Ashley Irish Community Centre and the New York Irish Centre, who are all members of the coalition here in the audience. Um, so they are the backbone, they've been the backbone, they will continue to be the backbone um, and continue to grow with the needs of the community. So I don't know if there is time for questions, Carla, or no, we're done. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much.